you can be sure of this. I know in my heart that I am destined to do some good. Ever wonder what people gathered at your funeral will remember about you? What goodness are you destined to accomplish with your life? This is the tomb of St. Eugene de Mazenod, founder of the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, who died May 21, 1861. He came from a troubled family, lived in a violent and unjust society, and suffered through stressful personal situations. Each experience shaped him into a man people remembered as inspiring dignity, building community, and changing lives by responding to the needs of those most abandoned. Eugene's family was not perfect. His father, Charles Antoine, was president of the Court of Accounts, a highly educated and high-ranking official who lived wildly beyond his means. The de Mazinons always had financial problems and borrowed heavily to pay their debts. As a way out, Charles Antoine did what most men did in that situation, married a wealthy woman, putting money first and love, if it came at all, second. A marriage was arranged between 33-year-old Charles Antoine and a wealthy but middle-class 18-year-old named Marie Rose Jonis. Her family probably knew the de Mazinods needed money, but they wanted their daughter to marry into high society. The families drew up a contract on February 2nd, 1778, and the couple married the next day. They had three children. The oldest, Charlotte Elizabeth, died at the age of five. Charles Joseph Eugene, the only boy, was next, followed by Charlotte Eugenie Antoinette, born three years after Eugene. The family townhouse with its courtyard and garden was on the most elegant street in Aix, France. Surrounded by a dozen servants, their family of four lived a happy and privileged life. Already by the age of five, Eugene showed his headstrong and impulsive personality with its explosive temper and upper-class prejudices. Eugene's father had a difficult personality, and it bothered him to see he had passed it on to his son. But Eugene also had compassion and sensitivity. One day, seeing a little charcoal gatherer dressed in tattered rags, he traded his own clothes, jacket, breeches, and shoes with the boy. Returning home, his embarrassed nanny and horrified mother scolded this son of a president of parliament. Should not a president's son dress differently from a charcoal gatherer's son? Eugene replied simply, very well, I will be president of the charcoal haulers. A king ruled France in 1788, controlling all aspects of life. Most citizens were mistreated and lived in poverty, while the king's family and those in high positions lived in obscene luxury. For example, when Queen Marie Antoinette's first daughter was born, she limited the number of servants attending the baby to only 80. At the age of eight, Eugene and his family were immersed in the bloody events of the French Revolution. Years of economic crisis and several bad harvests left taxpayers penniless, hungry, and rioting in the cities. The king, needing money to support his expensive lifestyle, decided to tax the nobility. This had never been done, and Charles Antoine, part of this privileged upper class, refused. The king resented the pope's authority and sought to control the church by demanding that priests be answerable only to government. Pope Pius VI objected. The king responded violently, beheading those who disagreed. Of the 42,000 killed, most were peasants and workers. In December 1790, the revolutionaries threatened to hang Charles Antoine in his own courtyard because he had continued to defend his class privileges despite the hardships it caused the poor. He escaped to Italy, disguised as a huntsman. The threat was real. On Tuesday, December 14th, a lynch mob broke into the prison, dragged out two noblemen, and hung them from a lamppost outside the de Mazinod home. From his window, Eugene could see the two dangling corpses, a reminder that his father could be one of them. 
Charles Antoine, safe in Italy, feared his son would be murdered in this violence and sent Eugene's uncle for the child. After many arguments, his mother and her family finally agreed to Eugene's departure. Fearing the revolutionists, he would leave in secret. The boy begged to visit a family he was very close to. Feeling the tears about to flow, he hugged them and quickly left with a simple goodbye. Recalling Eugene's sensitivity, they admired his extraordinary courage. It would be 12 years before he would return to Aix. Within a short time, his mother joined them. Charles Antoine was disappointed to learn that she would come only if she brought her mother, great aunt, and cousins with her. Staying longer than expected in Italy, Eugene was enrolled in a school run by a religious group of priests. The superior, Father Leopold Scotti, was a man of common sense and excellent human qualities who balanced discipline and caring. There was another reason his parents chose the city of Turin. They wanted the king's personal surgeon to remove a growth near Eugene's left eye that was disfiguring his face. Wanting to spare his parents' worry, Eugene begged Father Scotti to change the time of the operation. Father Scotti did so, but Eugene, frightened by all the surgical instruments, called off the operation. Returning to his dormitory, Eugene felt overwhelmed and defeated. Kneeling down, he prayed for help. Now believing in God's strength, his fear vanished. He ran to Father Scotti, asking that the surgeon be called back. Since anesthesia was not used at that time, Eugene underwent the 10-minute operation, fully conscious, seeing and hearing everything. His parents arrived to find him already healing. In April of 1794, the de Mazenods pooled their money with other refugees to charter a boat for a 12-day voyage to Venice, Italy. Venice, once of first-class maritime and commercial power, had become a city of promiscuous pleasure seekers. Despite the carnival atmosphere, Eugene's family anxiously worried about their limited finances and unknown future, leaving the 12-year-old bored and depressed. Realizing the de Mazenods could not afford to pay for Eugene's education, their pastor asked a good young priest, Father Bartolo Zanelli, to tutor him. Each day for three years, Eugene crossed the street to study at the Zanelli home. After lunch, he and Father Bartolo went for a walk, always stopping to pray at one of the churches. In the evening, they prayed evening prayers and the rosary. Bishop de Mazenod wrote that his vocation to the priesthood dated back to that time. The experience provided the stable and nurturing atmosphere missing from his family. His parents' relationship was falling apart. There was the 15-year age gap between them, differences in their education, and opposite ideas about saving and spending money. A more serious problem was the constant interference of Marie Rose's mother. Unable to endure the stress, his mother took Eugene's sister, Nanette, and returned to France in 1795. By divorcing her husband, Marie Rose recovered the family's property and money, gave up her title of nobility, and became part of the middle class. Their divorce split the family. Eugene, his father and uncle, traveled from Venice to Naples to stay ahead of the French armies and bad business deals. As refugees, his father described their situation. Misery and destitution are our only outlook. On the evening of January 6, 1799, they arrived in another Italian city, Palermo. Immediately on his arrival, he stepped into a life of luxury. Eugene felt as if divine providence led him to the friendship of the Duke and Duchess of Canizzaro. He was treated as one of the family, like a brother to their sons. The rooms were luxurious, the meals magnificent, and servants plentiful. There was always a place set for him at their table, and he went along to their summer home. The Duchess provided his life with more than material goods and entertainment. She encouraged him in reading and public speaking skills and other areas where his education was lacking. Besides correcting his egotistical behavior, the saintly woman taught him the spiritual dimension of justice. Most of her income went to the poor, and she chose Eugene to distribute this money. Was it then that he began to realize what real poverty could be? In May 1802, Eugene mourned the death of the Duchess. 
his second mother. Her generosity toward those in need had been an inspiring example. Eugene's grief was intensified by his mother's demand that he return to France alone. Amid tears and hugs, Eugene left his father and uncles behind in Italy and arrived in France with no one to greet him. His parents loved him, but placed him into the middle of an emotional tug of war. Now 20, he had to begin his life again. Impressed by the example of Father Zanelli's life, he considered becoming a priest. Now, however, he seriously considered getting married, only for business reasons, of course. Marie Rose sought out possible marriage partners. From a wealthy family, he described the first young woman as having a lovely face and a fine figure. Before the details were settled, she died of tuberculosis. He told his father, the plan fell through, let's drop the subject. The second prospect had a dowry of 40,000 francs at marriage and another 20,000 at the death of her parents. Eugene complained that he wanted a wife with 150,000 francs and better than middle class. Except for the time in Naples, Eugene lived very little with his father. Through letters, the cultured Charles Antoine tried to correct Eugene's flaws. He wrote, I recommend that you try to be more genteel and amiable. You were correct, but being correct is not all that matters. You are also expected to observe certain amenities. Speaking very brusquely and peevishly slapping your gloves on the table, that was not the way to act, my boy. I have an obligation to see that you learn how to conduct yourself in polite society. Amidst all this shallowness, stirring within Eugene was an urge to live a deeper Christian life. In December 1805, he was on the path leading to his conversion. His sensitivity could not tolerate injustice, even for those convicted of crimes. A week after joining a church association at the service of prisoners, he was protesting against the baker who provided bad bread to the men behind bars. Eugene also organized numerous collections to aid the poor. His father continued in exile, practically penniless, and cared for by his brother and Eugene. Eventually, Charles Antoine returned to France, where he died at age 75 on October 20th, 1820. His mother was a complex person. He experienced her pious devotion to the Virgin Mary, but also her mood swings in which she could be compassionate but also cruelly explosive, self-sacrificing and self-centered, loving and spiteful. Although she didn't always show it, she did love her son, and Eugene genuinely loved his mother. Madame de Mazenod died at Aix in 1851 at the age of 91. Eugene, the compassionate child that gave the clothes off his back to a child in need. The haughty, self-centered and shallow adolescent who believed he knew everything. A man intolerant of injustice who says to us, We are put on this earth to sanctify ourselves while helping one another by our example, our word, and our prayers. Searching for meaning in the face of God, he found both in helping the abandoned reach the other side of struggle. <laughs>